Mm, who wants to take a road trip? I do. Welcome to the Chef's Pantry. I'm Anna Rossi, and what a day. So, guys, this is a great episode. I hope you're in for uh, a tasty bite of some seafood because we're, we're in good hands today. We're headed down to Newport. It is the seaside city on a Quidneck Island in Rhode Island. Um, it is one of my absolute favorite favorite day trips being based in Boston, um, from the gorgeous Gilded Age mansions on Bellevue Ave to the yacht-filled harbors and its sailing sensibility. So if you've been to Newport, you know there's Thames Street and there's this amazing wharf and harbor front walk. Well, Howard Wharf has a new kit on the block. This is the Reef. It had a soft launch pre-pandemic and now it is in full swing, and we're going to be cooking with John Lopresti, who's the Director of Culinary Development there, whipping up, of course, some seafood. So let's head on over and connect with Chef John. Hi! Hey, how are you? I'm so great, and I love that we are literally seeing you basically with just the water a stone's throw out that window, aren't we? It's right there. The marine is there. But first, let me say thank you for having me and having us. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Well, welcome to the neighborhood. I mean, basically, this is a really big deal. I know it, it was, you guys got your feet on the ground pre-pandemic, but it must be really exciting feeling that the summer is like blossoming before you guys. It's, you know, everyone went through a very, you know, how would we say, unprecedented time. At this point, having the restrictions lifted, seeing people out maskless, we seem to be past you know the critical portion of this. And yeah, it's just wonderful to see people down and out and enjoying um, a bit of regularity. And I'm glad that they're spending a lot of their time with us. <laughs> Eating and drinking, and certainly the sailing community comes hungry and thirsty, right? Yeah. So your space is really amazing. I actually have been to a wedding reception there years ago in its former life. But tell me about what the reef is bringing to the table now. You know, I, I think a little bit of everything um, from our Harborside Bar into our main dining area here. Everything has its own feel, its look. Um, and then back to our ward room in the back, which gives that kind of clubby where the captains might hang out with their NCOs or, or if they let them in there, who knows. But either way, this, I think for everyone here, from outside to inside, the, the place itself is quite unique. I think it offers a, a, a physical space for everyone, everyone's taste. Um, and um, the feedback that I've been getting is really nice, you know. And so you're, you're, and, 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 I, and obviously we have one of the most beautiful views of the harbor there, there are. So, I mean, it's we're right panoramic. Here. And you're director of culinary development. What are some of the things that you're most proud of on the menu? Um, I would say, well, first let me qualify that I think I'm most proud of the staff that we have in place. So I want to give kudos to them because coming through this period, they're the ones that had to adjust and let me deliver a different version of what the reef was trying to be and what the owners want the reef to be ultimately down the road as we brand who we are and people feel comfortable and familiar. So a number of the things that we put on the menu, we want it to be fun, to be sexy, you know, for people to come in and have, want to share a few different things because they can't decide what to get. And then we kept some of our standards that were really selling well that, so we don't want to disappoint our returning guests. Um, so the things I'm most proud of, I'm most proud of their performance and them executing the vision um, and the plan that we've had and with the quality and the consistency, being able to purchase really great seafood right here at our fingertips um, from multiple sources. So, I mean, you know, the, the scallop dish that I'm going to do today is something that's really taken off of people. It's a real seasonal, beautiful summery dish um, that'll pair well with the drink we'll talk about later, too. So yeah. with that said, there's a number of things, but I feel that uh, we're evolving as a restaurant and as a group. And we find new and different ideas to put our spin on it um, each and every day. So we're just putting a few new things together for our summer menu as well. But uh, for our fans out there, your, you know, your faves are going to be on the menu. But we're also going to keep challenging uh, us and you with uh, some new things too. 
Well, it's fun with the assignment of international seafood, like what you know, the sort of the spirit of the reef, because you know, you're thinking like, oh, Rhode Island lobster rolls, clam chowder, but I love that you've done like the lobster olive vodka, you have the zatar salmon, you have like a, a fresh take on the calamari, all these things that are really just gorgeous and kind of out of the box um, and that pair well with drinks and the whole summer vibe. It's totally, totally great thing. Oh, and this Frosé looks so good. It's the summer of Frosé over at the Rossi house. So <laughs> putting my proportions just right. right. So, okay, so you're born and raised in New York. What what do you love about Newport? Is, I mean, you've been there for a few years now, but like what was the biggest change for you making the move north? Oh, you know, I think my wife and I moved up in the spring of 2018. We had been living on the North Fork of Long Island, running a private country club for about 14, 15 years. Um, before then, had our own restaurant. So, I mean, we've had such a great journey together that at that time, even though the North Fork is so beautiful, right in the middle of the wine country in the agri area there, and just two hours from New York and most of our friends who live in the States and or the East Coast, um, we just figured something different and Sandra had an opportunity um, and uh, we took it, you know? it's It's been that kind of thing, but we didn't realize how beautiful the coastline was here. We had been up once together. I had been up once many, many years ago. And I always said, you know, it's just so beautiful. I've always grown up around the water. My wife is Austrian, so she's a lake girl. But we always knew we wanted to stay close to the water. So when we started prospecting and looking for a change, Newport just hit us. And uh, luckily, there was an opportunity here. And it didn't take me too long to see the lay of the land, so to speak, and meet some good people. And uh, I'm working for a couple of really good uh, owners at this point right now and, um, and a great staff in place. So I'm happy to be here. That's so great. OK, well, I love that one of my favorite seafood dishes is on the menu for for us today in the chef's pantry. Scallops. Why well, say scallops? Do you say scallops or scallops? You guys say scallops because it's the A thing, right? <laughs> I, I, I say scallops. It's an ongoing debate I have with my producer. <laughs> but, um, so, so yeah, there are many ways to serve up scallops in delicious ways. How? What? Tell me about the dish that right. you're preparing. My preferred to, to most seafood, well, most mollusks in a sense, especially. These are Georgia's Bank dry sea scallops. They're basically just some of the largest, most delicious briny scallops you can have. So I love them pan seared. It's a personal preference. Lightly salted and peppered, which will do. Um, others, people like them grilled. It's a matter of taste. It's a personal taste. The dish, the inspiration of the dish, think surf and turf. Um, there's nothing like a briny scallop or you know another seafood item matched. You would think maybe a lobster tail with a fillet is the traditional surf and turf, but for me, this combination with the chorizo sausage and that richness and a little bit of smoke and fat and grease, along with the earthiness of the asparagus and then just the brightness of the salsa and the richness and also the earthiness of the uh, the cauliflower puree that we base it on, it's more or less what I'm trying to teach our cooks here and what we're trying to do here is taking our inspiration from multiple sources, global sources, global ideas, putting our spin on it and creating layers of flavor. That's what I've always tried to do in, within my career and, and being trained by some really smart people, very talented chefs, is about layers. This way, when people are eating something, they keep going back to it going, what is that? You know, what is that? Wow, what is that? And what is that? So if that if we succeed in doing that, I think, then you bring people back to your table because they're yeah. interested to try other things and have yeah. that experience. Yeah, my favorite food are dishes that have the note of familiarity and the note of surprise perfectly synergized. That's yeah, that's there. really good, yeah. So where do we begin? Can you walk me through what you have in front of you? The ingredients look beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, this is such a simple recipe. I say simple, and of course, it means that you need to be at home and have a decent fan under your hood so you don't smoke your kitchen out, but, um, <laughs> which none of us have unless we have a commercial kitchen. So, But basically what I've done is we, we, we just bias cut. Um, I'll start at the top. We've got some beautiful Georges Banks uh, sea scallops right here that I'm going to lightly salt and pepper um, along with asparagus which I've cut in a little bias cut so it looks pretty but overall just to bite size so it doesn't need a knife um, bias cut chorizo sausage also like this this is in the, the raw form and then the pepperonata salsa um, which will be a garnish for the end a little bit of cilantro or anything else that you like 
if you're a dill person or you're a parsley person or so forth. Mm. It really is up to you what you, where you want to go. But I'll put the core together. And also, um, you know, we talked about that. I think you mentioned the word. It was comfort or familiar. And then the wow, the surprise. So that's where the cauliflower puree comes in, which I have heating up to the side here. Um, but essentially, what, what if, if, if I can, um, just as I put in, you'll see in the recipe, so forth and so on for people at home, is a medium high heat, um, mm -hmm. not too much oil. will kind of mitigate that smokiness and so forth and so on. It's really, it, it, unless you have a home grill or griddle, as you would do at home, you could use that as well. So either way, whatever you feel like. But as far as the scallops go, I'm just going to take a little bit of salt. And like I said, it's all a matter of personal taste, how much you use, what type of salt you use, whether you use a kosher or a sea salt, like this. And basically, I have a nice hot pan over here. And are you using olive oil or vegetable well, oil? Very good question. So what I'm using is a canola oil. It's 90% okay. Uh, rapeseed, 10% olive oil, has a higher smoking point. And it's also, you don't want to waste a good oil um, for cooking, in a sense, because you don't need to. Um, you want something that's going to hold up a little bit better and not impart any kind of a critic or off flavor to the, what you're cooking. So a canola oil, a grapeseed oil, is definitely, a, you know, the one you'd want to go with when you're cooking at a medium to high temp. Like Do you have a rule of thumb when it comes to cooking scallops? Because I feel like so many people fail. Um, don't overcook them. I think they fail when, when they, you just have to pray. And, and are, you, are you watching? Are you timing? Are you touching? So it depends on how much control you have. If you have an electric top, a heat top, how much you can get. But I'm going to show you the color that you're going to be looking for on the scallops when they come from the pan. Um, and that'll be something where you could just, when you turn them, you'll go, oh, wow, that's a beautiful golden brown. Um, so in that sense, then you can decide how far you want to go and finishing in the oven, as I suggested in the recipe. Mm. So most restaurants that would serve it, they're going to serve them quote unquote medium. So they're a touch translucent in the middle, mm. but not too raw and not overcooked and dried out. The worst thing you can do to a scallop at any, whether it's a Nantucket or a Peconic base on the, on the bay side or a large dry sea scallop is to overcook it because then it loses all of its nuance, all of its brine, all of its charm. It's gone. So right. it's fleeting. It's just a rubbery little pellet then. So but while the scallops are browning, um, they're looking at a nice little bubble in the pan over there. I have another pan um, and this is very simple. What we can do is just take on one half, put a little bit too much there. So we're going to take a good amount of the chorizo. We don't want to be too lean on that. That's going to look nicely. There we go. Our scallops are starting to talk to us which are really nice. As and are you going to be rendering the chorizo to get some of that nice fat? Very smart. We're going to be using some of that. So our scallops are coming along nicely. Great. And let them go slow and steady, you know? And if yeah. you, feel like, you feel like your pan wasn't hot enough, you can take them out and you can start over on the other side. So don't think that you failed. If all of a sudden you look at it, it's boiling and they look blonde and you're not happy, take them out, get a new pan, start over, and you'll be fine. Just mm. make it hotter the next time. So with that said, um, working the chorizo um, in the next pan, we're going to look to get some nice color and render out some of that nice fat. Um, so I'm just starting with them. I'm going to let them get started a little bit on my next pan here. Well, and I like that you've sliced it on the bias. Not only is that visual, but you've also created more surface area. Yeah. For the, that great sear. For both reasons, yeah. I mean, listen, we are a restaurant and we do need to have an aesthetic. I mean, when people... What I try to train the guys that that, that that come into kitchens and work with me is I give them an acronym that's really fun. It's AT&T. And the AT&T is basically appearance, taste, and texture. Those are the three things that I try to instill in them to put into a dish. Because the first thing that happens to you is, um, oh, this is great. We have some nice activity here, um, is they see it. so And it has to be pleasing to the eye. So that's one reason. And not overdone. And it's not culinary, you know, um, gymnastics in a sense but it needs to be appealing then the first taste needs to be or oh, what is that and it needs to have texture and then it brings them back so I'm just gonna bring the scallop over for a second to show you when I turn them to show you really where you can get such a beautiful I think we have we can see nice. that yeah I love that crust really nice, a really nice sear on that 
So we'll just now what I'm going to do since we're here is ordinarily at home, if you want, you could sear these ahead of time. So you're ready for your guests and you don't have to just bury yourself in the kitchen is you can take these and put them on a sizzle platter or a baking plate or a foil and finish them in the oven to the temp where you're happy with. So um, we're going to finish them right here for the sake of this um, demonstration. And so now that I'm getting a nice, a nice rendering on the uh, chorizo, look at that color. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's great. It's and cool. that's, I, I appreciate that you're using the cast iron skillet. Like it, it gives you that great advantage. Yeah, it's just, you know, it, it does so, it does so much for for putting a nice um, edge on most proteins, and also uh, certainly uh, some some uh, mostly fish proteins. But we have a nice thing. So what I'll do now is, since that's coming, I'm going to take our asparagus. And did you blanch the asparagus? Yeah, you know, if you're using the, it's a really good. You ask good questions. This is not the first time you've done this, right? Um, no. So, so yes, uh, we did. What you can do, though, if you're using a pencil asparagus or something real thin, um, not necessary. If you cut them small enough. With these, these were kind of a small to medium size. I'll go back to the uh, camera if you want. And it, uh, it, they led themselves better to be blanched a little bit. This way, I didn't have to overcook them in the pan. I just want to heat them through. Yeah. So, in a sense, uh, these have been blanched. Obviously, if you have a thicker um, stalk asparagus, you definitely need to do that. So. So basically what we're doing now is we're, we're letting these melt. Um, scallops are coming along beautifully right now. I could just see on the side of the scallop, if you're questioning yourself at home, like where do we, how far do I go? You can see that it still has this translucent look on the side. Let me try to get to you over here. A little bit here. So I would say that for the most part, this needs to done another two minutes at home for you, if you're home um, in the pan, or if you had a very hot oven, um, might take, you know, a little bit longer depending on how hot. So like I said, it all depends on so, where, where you are. Chef, do you have any tips for buying scallops? Because oftentimes it's not uncommon to find that they're, uh, what is it, triphosphate soda that yes. is in there? Or or like, are they based on count when you're finding a good size? Um, two answers to two questions. One, you don't want to, if you can avoid, and if you have a good fishmonger, most of your supermarket scallops are going to have the, uh, they're going to be processed. I mean, they're going to be injected. They're going to have phosphate. Um, they do that for a number of reasons. And it just, it dilutes the, 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 the flavor of, of the scallop. And overall, we'll make them a little bit watery and not so good. <laughs> the, um, where you need to go is you need to go to your fishmonger. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have one in Middle, Middletown here. Um, and he ask the question, you know, ask yeah. to listen. I want dry sea scallops. I want big. Right. If you want to know the number, the number of what we call these are U10s. Okay. Means meaning that basically what that means is that they're basically about 10 count to the pound. So mm -hmm. of these scallops is about 1.5 to 1.6 ounces, give or take. So you would ask the monger if they are dry scallops? Yes. Say, hey, okay. look, usually they're pretty good. They'll mark on their things whether they're previously frozen because yeah. most of them, other than that these large sea scallops will be, um, but they'll mark if they've been previously frozen or if they're fresh and they are dry seas. Ask the question. Well, I, and I like that idea for advocating for the best scallops possible because it's so disappointing when you find those big juicy looking scallops in the case and you get them home, you throw them in a hot pan and then all of a sudden you're just in a steam bath. And I'm watching those and it's a really nice dry oily pan and they're staying that beautiful, huge texture yeah. and size. So that that's what you get when you're when you're at, when you make sure that you're sourcing the, the ingredients well. And yeah. I love that you have that nice like crust on the outside. It's gonna I, give some anyone can do it and use a nonstick pan at home. It'll, it'll give you the same opportunity not yeah. to get it won't stick and so forth. Don't be afraid to use a good nonstick. What do you think about basting? Are you going to base them in butter or? Well, here's where I, I would ordinarily, um, I'm classically French trained. Um, so basically everything, butter makes everything better um, in my world. But what we're trying to do a little bit here is um, where it's, we absolutely know that it will enhance a dish and make things more appealing. We will use butter copiously. Um, we're watching our salt in the kitchen. It's different than it used to be. People are more conscious of it, so we are more conscious of it. In this case, if I was at Oceana in New York back then, 
I would be basting like mad with butter on those scallops. But uh, <laughs> but for our purposes today, we're this is a summer. It's a clean dish, you know, and it's a we're, we basically just be. It, it doesn't need it. Would it help? Yeah. Sure, you could put some butter in there. But yeah. I like that you're getting the fat from the chorizo. Yeah, we're picking up a little bit of that the we're using and using the butter. All right, we're picking it up from the chorizo, which mm -hmm. is. I'd love to show you this again. What's happening here with the uh, chorizo and the asparagus? It's just all coming together. So once, basically, we're just going to push this together like a bit of a, a, a ragu, and it's going to really, really enhance uh, where we're at. Now I'm pretty close. Um, I think we can plate unless um, you have a couple other procedure questions for me. Um, no, I'm excited to see all the color come together, and I can't wait to see the cauliflower puree. This is fun. So basically, I'm just taking this off and burn it. I didn't have enough room on the table here. So the cauliflower puree is really. I'm going to run through. It. It's a very simple recipe. It's cauliflower florets broken into some equal parts. Um, I'll just right here. So, and cold water, one half of an onion, quiet. <laughs> one, uh, one half of onion, uh, season the water to your taste. Like I said, you could always season after as well. Um, bring it to a simmer, cook it till the cauliflower is just done. In a blender, half a cup of heavy cream or half and half, um, two tablespoons of butter, and blend it till it's nice and smooth. And basically what you get is this real nice bed of, yeah. of earthy, beautiful cauliflower, and which when, and obviously, you know, you're gonna, we're gonna have the nice fat from the chorizo and everything kind of roll into it. And then the vinaigrette from the pepperonata, which I'll talk about a little bit. So you've got so many different elements working for you right now. The brininess of the scallops, the fat, a little bit of smoke from the chorizo, um, and then the brightness of the salsa. But at the base of this, picking up the, at the base, this one of my favorite things is cauliflower, a puree of cauliflower and scallop alone. So mm. that's, where the, that's where this dish was built from. So basically what, what we have our kitchen chefs do is we decided how we want to uh, make this look fun and just kind of a bit whimsical there. So we just did a nice little swoosh of our scallop, of our uh, cauliflower puree, sorry, hello. And... Um, so the scallops are just they're perfect if i say so myself <laughs> they look perfect they, they look firm they look juicy they look like they have great texture i love that contrast of the white center with that caramelized golden i'm going to use my hands sorry guys so <laughs> we've got a really nice array. Um, now I'm just going to take, with, as far as the asparagus and, and this, this is, like I said, it, it needs to look pretty. It already does. So really, I'm not even looking to over, there's no tweezers in our kitchen, so forth and so on. There's spoons, there's forks, there's tongues. You know, we do what we need to do without having too much attention put on the plating but it being very focused, so it does look pretty. So easily, you're gonna do this at home, you're not gonna sit there with a pair of tweezers. So we're gonna take and put a nice amount of, of that garnish, which would be just about what I weighed out for you for your recipe, like that. Right. And then just make sure that when you make the pepperonata, and this pepperonata with the red, yellow pepper and the red onion, I put a little bit of scallion. This could be anything you like. I mean, if you like, I have some cilantro over here as well. If you enjoy cilantro, um, chive dill even i mean you don't want to go too far into the rosemary thyme thing that might be a little bit too too much but a fresh herb that you choose that you, that you really like yourself you can use it and if you're not it depends on if you're not a, a pepper person you could do a tomato salsa i mean mm. you you can you can modify this a little bit they both will work you know so basically what i ask the guys to do is be thoughtful about the plating and just give each scallop Oh, and one thing with the pepperonata, when you make it and you do with the red wine vinegar and, and let it macerate for like an hour or so, mm. strain it off before you garnish so you don't have too much of the vinaigrette getting uh, into the into the plate. You, you want the flavor of it that the peppers have already absorbed, but you don't want too much of the oil, okay? Great. Because you still have the oil from the chorizo. So I've let this drain out, and I'm just giving it a little bit of free drop on the scallops so they just it kind of just falls out. And if you really 
you know, if you're the home chef and you like garnishes, there's nothing wrong with a nice plush of uh, cilantro or pork parsley. And I would say that this is under this camera. There we go. That's gorgeous. I like the zhuzh right at the end with that last little flourish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and from a plating perspective, too, I love the choice of using the black plate for the contrast with that beautiful white creamy cauliflower puree. It just makes everything pop. It's so beautiful. It, for me, it was serendipity because when I, I've never, literally never worked with a black plate in my entire career. Until I, I, I Well, and I, I have cases of white plates, but... <laughs> For for that visual pop, I mean, when you think about right the A and A T and T, yeah, there yeah. you go. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it's I, and I just it's so I love the idea of how much play you can have. Like I'm thinking of like like you mentioned the tomatoes or sweet corn season, Absolutely. having a lot of um, fun with what you're sort of giving the scallops for their hairdo on top. And, and you know what, to, to your point, even with the puree that I just, cause I love in this right now, I know it's the summer, but that could easily become a, a corn succotash. It mm. could become a, a cool or warm version, or you could, you know, asparagus or spring veg, you can move on from those and think about something else that you'd rather use. Um, even, you know, a, a chopped shard or something interesting. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, I think what everyone, if they want to duplicate, the dishes really works well together. It's very satisfying. But you could definitely make this into a seasonal um, preparation and basically also what you personally like. So that's the nice about the flexibility with the salsa, flexibility with the cauliflower puree, the puree in the bottom. But the key is just buy a good scallop. And if you start from there, everything else will fall into place. Yeah, that looks fantastic and it looks so delicious i'm thirsty so what do you recommend for pairings well our bar um staff and has basically where are we now maybe i should go over there huh let me go here how's that that okay. looks okay yeah. so, Ooh, i like is that time that i see in there this is our summer time um and have with one of my favorite um liquors gin so Basically, what we've come up with, I mean, there's really, they come up with a lot of really fantastic concoctions, our mixologists here. Um, this one, uh, they call it the summertime, um, T-H-Y-M-E, obviously. So it's gin with fresh thyme, um, lemon, <coughs> sorry, house-made blueberry uh, syrup topped with a sparkling water. And it's oh. just light and refreshing, and it really, it, it, it just, it marries this dish really well, really well. Well, the color palette is a 10, those two combined. That looks so fantastic. I can just picture it, especially when we have a sunny day, sitting on the deck, looking at Newport Harbor with all the beautiful yachts and sailboats, eating those scallops and delicious summertime cocktail. That's like my kind of day right there. You should be here then. What are you doing there? Well, we, had, we, we, we plan on it very soon. So we, one more thing before we let you go, um, sure. back back to the kitchen. We have something called the Chef's Slice, where we get to learn a little bit more about you in the kitchen and what, what matters most to you. So to start things off, my favorite question, and I'm so curious to know, is what your favorite tool is. <laughs> tool? All right. I'll, I'll, I'll go with the standard. It's what I recommend, the sharp knife. The reason being is, in a sense, because most chefs, when they cut themselves or they have problems in the kitchen, it's because their knives aren't sharp. But in this sense, at this point, it's kind of like a, a cliche. So I won't say that. So I'm not going to say that. Um, favorite tool in the kitchen? Wow. Um, I don't know. There's so many assets required for a day-to-day -day operation. I mean, I have an executive chef in place here, an executive sous chef, another sous chef, a lead prep chef. Each and every day they come to me and say, hey, I want to do this. You know, can you get me this? Can you get me that? And most of it, you know what? I would say for me, my favorite things in the kitchen at this point are what they need. Um, and, and for me to get things to make their life easier, um, to make their production time quicker and more successful and some way to get them from A to Z. So I guess other than the sharp knife point, I, mean, I would say that my, you know, my, my most critical, you know, kitchen 
our uh, kitchen items, so to speak, assets, um, are my crew. Yeah, strong team. My crew, yeah. yeah. What is your favorite type of seafood to cook? All right, so you mean last meal kind of thing? Um, sure, or, or the, fun, the most fun to prepare, I don't know. Well, I mean, the, really, the only thing I do cook at home anymore for my wife and I is when we have an opportunity to have a day off, which that may happen again one day, um, is just a charcoal grill at home and with garden veg. I mean, living on the North Fork, we had farm stand after farm stand, like right there uh, on, on the main road. And, you know, fish was just surrounding us as it is here. So, yeah, I mean, really seasonal fresh grilled vegetables. Um, we both love grilled onions and, you know, in season, whatever veg is happening and some nice roasted, you know, yellow Yukon potatoes and a nice piece of fish, a good zucchini when it's right or squash when it's not waterlogged and it actually has some flavor. So, I mean, that stuff at home is kind of what, what I like to do. I mean, as far as my kind of me, I mean, from the ocean, I guess there's a time, it's a couple times a year when soft shell crabs run. And at one point when I was really young, I mean, I wouldn't eat much of, of that type of seafood, but I fell in love one day. And I would say that probably if there's one thing that just is my umami is um, probably a soft shell crab when, mm. it's, when it's right and, and handled right. And yeah, it's one of those things. You either love it or hate it. It's kind of like sea urchin. It's like uni. Yeah. Um, you either love it or it's just, oh, no. So. That's we kind of love it. Yeah, you have some good little coves to go soft shell crabbing not too far from where you are in Newport. I've heard. I'm looking forward to seeing some of that, uh, some residual bounty from that. So my friends, <laughs> yeah. if you see this, my new friends, make sure that uh, I see some of that. Okay. Yeah, I I don't I feel it might might be my dark side or like feeling really connected to what I'm eating, but I even love cleaning the soft shell crab, like snipping out their gills and chopping off their face. <laughs> Like, I can be fast friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I really am like a nurturing mother, but there's just something about cleaning a soft shell crab that's so damn gratifying. <laughs> God, that's so uh, what's the biggest mistake? One last question that people you think make when it comes to preparing seafood. The biggest mistake. Um, over seasoning or under seasoning. So that's the trick. Now, if you're not using salt in your diet, then that becomes quite an easy Solution is an easy solution. Yeah, under seasoning, over seasoning, and just stepping out of your comfort zone. If you haven't seared anything like this, a scallop at, at a high, to, a medium to high heat, you know, you need to practice on some things. Don't practice on the meal that you're cooking for your guests that night. If you're going to do this, practice on some other, get some small pieces of cod, of, of high moisture fish, and see where you, your pan at home needs to be if you want to do that style. Um, that's my recommendation. So you're not stuck going, oh my God. I just boiled my scallops or I just burned this, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's really about, about seasoning and, and handling the protein um, the correct way. And uh, all I can only suggest is the two tips that I offered you is practice a little bit if you want to do this at home and if you have good ventilation, so forth and so on. Um, or even if you're out on the backyard on the grill, I mean, you know, just you can do it there as well, whether you're right on the grid, the grill when it's hot or you have a foil or whatever you're protecting it with. You just don't want to get, you don't want to, you don't want to lose your meal, so to speak. So yeah. be conscious of that. Because if something's over salt and it is done, you can't take it back. Rule number one, you can always add. That's what I tell my line cooks as well. You can always add, you can't take away. So go yeah. easy. <clears throat> Practice makes perfect. Yeah. Well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so great. Well, next time, let's not do this virtually. Let's do it when the Newport Sea Breeze is kissing our cheeks. And I'm coming in for those scallops in summertime, Chef. This was so fantastic. Thank you so much for the amazing and thorough tutorial. And best of luck with the rest of the summer season. And once again, uh, thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. And can't wait to see you all down at the reef. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. So good. And yes, take away, make sure your scallops are dry. You don't want them to shrink in your pan. Um, so thanks guys. I love seeing your comments and so many scallop enthusiasts, Stephen and Molly. I know you're going to make scallops tonight for dinner. This inspired you. And AJ, let's make scallops tonight. I think that's a great idea, honey. Um, thanks for tuning in, you guys. Um, you can catch us 
Mondays for now, but we have some amazing things in the pipeline coming to you, um, bigger and better than ever. So, so stand by. Um, and so much going on digitally. We have Mom to Mom, The Hub Today, Lux Life with Derek Z, so much stuff. So I just can't even keep it all straight. We'll see you soon and eat well, be kind, drink and make merry. Bye guys. <laughs>